Boa tarde a todos. Um, vamos começar a conversa que vai ser em inglês. I will just start in Portuguese and then we switch to English. Uh, se houver alguém que não está confortável com o inglês que avise, eu tento ir fazendo assim uns resumos e, e traduções. Nós vamos estar a gravar também um, e depois vamos colocar a conversa no, no, no YouTube do Live. So, first of all, thank you very much for uh, joining us and for, for accepting. Um, you are an author, an activist, uh, an entrepreneur. I'm going to follow here my, my, my notes. And you are also the founder and CEO of Democracy Next, which is a research and action institute that works to shift political and uh, legislative power to everyday people, empowering uh, citizens' assemblies. Um, and you, from, from what I, I saw and from what I researched, you do fascinating work and you are, were also involved in the creation of Paris Citizens' Assembly, the Citizens' Council of uh, the German-speaking community in Belgium, and the Permanent Citiz Citizens' Assembly for Climate in Brussels. You also have uh, uh, other experience, uh, mentoring social design masters in the Design Academy in Eindhoven and uh, many other things. First of all, I would like to ask you how you got interested in uh, designing these democratic processes and democratic innovation. So if you could speak a bit about your background and how you got here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a that's a good starting point. So first of all, thank you for, for hosting this event this evening and thank you all for, for coming here. So um, as uh, Paolo was saying, my name is Claudia and um, I guess the, before jumping into what I'm doing today, how I how I got into doing work around citizens assemblies, thinking about a next democratic paradigm started about 12, 13 years ago, initially through research that I was doing around populism and trying to understand the extent to which people's disillusionment with politics, with the system, with feeling like they didn't have agency or voice to be truly shaping decisions that were affecting their lives their communities was driving people towards populist parties and movements. And um, it's, I mean, it's a complex phenomenon, so I'm not saying that's the only thing that's part of it, but from my research, I became really convinced that this was a big part of, of, of the story. And if we recognize that's the case, then it's not going to be just different or better top-down policies on the economy or immigration or anything that truly gets to people feeling like they have more agency and voice in, in shaping the decisions <laughs> affecting them. So um, that was the, the initial entry point into my interest into what's kind of called democratic innovation a bit more broadly. So thinking about the new ways that our, our institutions can be evolving to give people a more direct and meaningful say in shaping decisions. And um, from a really broad exploration of different ways to do that, when I first came across citizens assemblies, there was a bit of this light bulb moment of like, oh, this feels like something really different that's not just trying to treat some of the symptoms of these really deep problems but actually getting to those hot, deeper roots of them as well um, and so that has now been the focus of, of what i've been doing for about a decade or so um, and yeah maybe i'll leave it there as an introduction and i'm sure you have some <laughs> questions that come off of that but, okay so, so this isn't too much of a monologue <laughs> so we yeah. in libra we discuss a lot citizens assemblies it's uh it's something that we usually include in our political electoral programs to propose in the different levels, the national level, the local level. Um, so it's a sort of a key proposal for us. Um, and so I would like to start maybe by, I don't know, uh, playing a bit devil's advocate because sometimes um, citizens' assemblies are um, talked about as the key to solve the democratic crisis that we are living in, to stop populism, to, I mean, uh, like, a, like a, almost like a kind of magic spell that will solve all of this. So I would like to ask, what do you think about this? Uh, how do you see this? How do you feel that uh, citizens' assemblies can help to solve this, this crisis? Yeah, and, well, it's a good question. First of all, I just want to kind of check with a show of hands. Does everyone here know what a citizens' assembly is? Or should I explain this to you? So that, 
No. Okay. So, no, I appreciate the honesty because I want to make sure everyone's actually on the same page about what we're talking about yeah. um, before I answer the question. So, um, rather than give a definition, I'll give you an example um, of, what, of what, a recent one that happened in France, where I live now. Um, so, just this past December, the, the French government convened the French Citizens' Assembly on end-of-life issues about whether the existing legislation around end-of-life to do with euthanasia, assisted dying, and the wider remit of issues around that should change and how. Um, and to be able to, to, to answer such a question, they convened 184 people that were selected by Lot 3 to be broadly representative of French society. Uh, they met for 27 days of deliberation over the course of four months. And they heard from around 60 experts, but experts in a broader sense. So not just kind of doctors and nurses and people studying these issues, but also, um, also faith leaders, philosophers, people with lifelong illnesses. Uh, and then they deliberated with one another, meaning that they weighed up all of this information they received, they listened to one another, and they worked to develop 67 really detailed recommendations for the French government about how this legislation should change and why. Um, and they re quite remarkably, I think, achieved 92% consensus amongst themselves behind these 67 recommendations that they delivered to President Macron at the beginning of April. And now this will form um, the basis of the parliamentary debate about how this will, will change and, and the legislation should change by the end of summer is the timeline. Um, so the key kind of defining characteristics of a citizens assembly are that people are selected by lottery, that there's the time and the, kind of conditions for people to be able to deliberate and grapple with the complexity of issues that are being faced. Um, hello. <laughs> and, then, um, and then there's the work to, to find common ground on the shared proposals, usually trying to get at least a 70 to 80% threshold of agreement amongst the group. So it's not just voting and aggregating preferences, it's really doing that hard work to get to, to a form of consensus um, around the, the final recommendation <coughs> as the kind of defining feature. So this is what I mean by, by citizens' assembly here in, in this context of, of the conversation. Um, and I guess to, to maybe re, um, I don't know, reiterate your question for the sake of people who have <laughs> have just arrived as well. The question was was about whether these citizens assemblies, um, you know, sometimes they're kind of talked about as though this will save democracy and, and you know, that's kind of all we need now. And mm -hmm. and um, and what do I think about this? I mean, short version of the question, the slightly longer question. Um, well, there's a few few aspects to that from my perspective. One is I don't think it's some sort of magic bullet solution. I think there are many things that need to, to change and evolve. But I, I really do see citizens' assemblies, though, as a core element of what I think needs to change when we're thinking about the democratic crisis that we're in, in a context where there's a lack of trust, not just of people in government and in institutions, but I think there's a deep crisis of trust in the other direction as well. Um, and mm -hmm. there needs to be a, a, a rebuilding of that through demonstrating trust in people. Um, I think we need to be creating the conditions that bring together diverse groups of people over extended periods of time together if we want to do something about about polarization. Um, and I think that there's a general sense of stuckness on many different really pressing political issues that have to do with a lot of the systemic nature of how an electoral system with political parties and so on functions with three, four or five year electoral cycles, depending on where you are, um, the, the logic of campaigning and party politics and someone needing to win and someone being right or wrong. Um, it's a very different, different way of doing politics than coming together and really doing that work to be like, okay, how do we get to that 80% level of consensus amongst us around this? Um, and personally, I think we need more of that. And I think we don't just need more citizens assemblies. I think we really need to be um, making these citizens assemblies permanent with a legal basis integrated into this wider democratic system. So I'm not saying we should, you know, replace the parliament and get rid of politicians and get rid of the system. But I am saying I think that the overall system needs to evolve and citizens assemblies need to be a genuine part of it. And for me, the long term vision is not just a part of it with 
advisory power but actual decision making authority eventually as well um, so that raises lots of mm. questions I'm, I'm sure but um, yeah. it's also a problem with politicians so it's not just that citizens uh, are suspicious of politicians in general which mm. they are and that politicians are also suspicious of people which they also are it's the broader problem of how at least for me, how our political system is going, that parliaments are supposed to be citizens' assemblies. The parliaments should be a citizens' assembly. It should represent the people in the different types of people that live anywhere. But the truth is, and I've seen this, I was a, a local municipal deputy in, in Lisbon, and I think this happens in every level. When you are discussing things technical issues or in a closed, let's say, a closed commission meeting or something like this, usually everyone agrees. Left, right, uh, conservative, liberals. It's, it's easy to say, okay, no, yes, we should uh, do this. It's good that we, that we do this. But then there is always this pressure that someone needs to be right, someone needs to be wrong, that consensus is not valuable that someone needs to win, someone needs to lose, and that you need to differentiate yourself always from the enemy. So yeah. I think it's also a, a, a symptom, let's say, and, uh, and, um, and the reasons why the, the, our, our democratic system is evolving in this way that the politicians cannot get to a consensus. Mm. So, so there is the need to find it elsewhere let's say and uh, from the experiences that there have been put in place sometimes it's i mean it proves that it's not so hard to have a broader consensus about things that need to be done i see everyone better there's a lot more people there yeah. than we than we thought i no, no, it's fine <laughs> We had arranged things in a circle because we thought it would be more intimate, but no. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think actually I really appreciate you making that point because I don't want what I'm saying in any way to come across as though it's like politician bashing or, mm -hmm. or demonizing elected officials because I think a lot of people go into politics because they want to make a positive change in their communities and you know this is the means that we have in the system and and these are really systemic problems which you elucidate with the fact that you know often actually people agree but then you know outwardly there is a need to have some form of conflict or some forms of disagreement and this stems from from how the system is incentivized to function and why i think we need to be recognizing that systemic issue and trying to think about systemic solutions that can get us out to to do things differently um, because i also i slightly disagree with the characterization though of our parliaments as citizens assemblies though, mm. because citizens assemblies have traditionally been assemblies where people were either like assembled through mass participation like anyone showed up or people were selected through sortition, meaning random selection, um, but also just to, 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 to be there as citizens of a community living together. Whereas our parliaments today, because of political parties, function actually in a very different way. And th those party structures with, with candidates and how they're chosen and things means that people are not just in those parliaments as citizens, they're there also as representatives of parties. Mm -hmm. And that also changes, I think, the logic of, of how they function too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I meant is it's not that they are, it's mm -hmm. that in theory, mm -hmm. it, it should work like this. It should represent the people. So it should represent the will of the people. Mm -hmm. But of course, how it's been working for I mean, some yeah. decades now, it makes it that the incentive is not sometimes to solve problems mm. it usually it's not it's to find distinctions and to f win the next election mm. so it creates this uh, uh, no, there is a lack of incentives to to have this consensus to everyone mm. sits at the table and finds a solution though. like in in, mm. in 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 terms of in theory actually it's like a lot of the kind of architects of the systems that we have today of parliaments with political parties 
were really critical of the more consensus seeking forms of assemblies that existed mm. beforehand and thought that there should be much more social contestation through parties and like maybe reinforcing where we disagree on some things as well. And so it was actually an intentional choice to try and get to a system that was a little bit more conflictual hmm. um, in nature. So, hmm. okay. I mean, sorry, I don't want to go so that, in too a down way, the theoretical it, route, so but it, I think these things matter when we're thinking about yeah, 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 I know, yeah. for sure they do. <laughs> so in a way, it's also going back to the basics, let's say, mm. of uh, assemblies to to uh, to to take decisions in a more in a more democratic uh, way mm -hmm. um i don't know if you've been following the i mean in lisbon city hall has been trying to implement a form of uh, a form of citizen uh, assemblies um which is called the citizens council of lisbon mm -hmm. there i don't know if you follow this uh, if you know how we, how it works because sometimes it's uh, it's not just about the general idea it's also about the specifics of how it works of how mm. uh, what powers these councils have or not and what can they do or not um but i'd like to know what your opinion is the, mm. how you think it's uh, this experience is uh, working yeah well actually i was in conversation with some of the people within the mayor's office who were initially involved with actually setting up that assembly a long while back and and talking about how it would work and some of the design reflections and um but then i was not like intimately involved in any decisions that were taken after that conversation had with them or other things and i think one of the main like I think crucial points actually in the design of all these assemblies where there was a disagreement and I think a learning that now something is going to change with the second one if I understood correctly was how do you do the random selection and I think what happened with this first version of the citizens council here was that there was a call for volunteers to put mm -hmm. themselves forth and then there was a draw amongst the volunteers mm -hmm. and i think that introduces a big problem actually of bias of who's volunteering to put themselves forward in the first place and to me kind of contradicts actually one of the core like more values-based principles behind citizens assemblies and deliberative democracy that everybody should actually have an equal chance of being selected to be part of this in the first place and that by sending out invitations completely at random you also reach the people who would never just volunteer out of their own initiative without having someone kind of invite them into the process as well um, because it reaches people who don't necessarily vote who aren't involved in politics who you know probably would not show up to a meeting like this and and so i think we need to find the ways to actually invite them into into these assemblies as well and then amongst everyone who says yes then there's a second lottery and then broadly um and the technical term is stratifying, but basically controlling for that final group to be broadly representative um, of the community. So I think this was one of the main learnings about, you know, some slight bias, I think, about who was part of that assembly. But then I think beyond that, one of the things I'm interested in discussing is I also don't think there was enough time for the complexity of the issues that were mm -hmm. deliberated on. So I gave the example of a national level legislative issue just earlier so for those who didn't who came a little bit late i was saying how france's citizens assembly on end of life um, met for 27 days of deliberation over the course of four months um, on a local level and depending on what the issue is you probably don't need that much time for every issue um, but i think there's partly like a common sense test if you only bring people together for two days how much can you get into the complexity of the issue and how much space do you really have to do that hard work of being like, okay, how do we get to the common ground on what do we do about this? Um, so, so yeah, but I, I'm curious actually to hear from you and I don't know if others here were involved or have, have views on this. So it's also a bit more of a, of a conversation. Yeah. So, yeah. I would say if anyone yeah. wants to ask a question or a comment or yeah. to say anything, just, uh, show hands and I will because we really want and, this to be a, a, a I just conversation. want to say I really respect mm -hmm. as well because there was like a formal evaluation done of that assembly and a lot of the things that I'm mm -hmm. mentioning were also you know recognized in that evaluation and there's a reflection about how do you use those learnings so I think that's a very good approach to this too that, mm -hmm. you know, really yeah there was this there was this basic yeah. problem let's say which is 
quite common, I mean, in every uh, participation process that you have, if you just make an open call, usually the same type of, of people show up. So you have always a bias there. Uh, this should be helpful to get people that don't vote from poorer neighborhoods, maybe that they are immigrants, they don't speak the language, so they don't you know, don't maybe can read the 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 the, the, the publicity outside. Um, so it's really uh, it should be. I mean, this is one of the uh, of the of the mistakes. Let's say that we pointed out. It should go beyond the usual people that uh, get involved in this in this kind of uh, in this kind of processes in this kind of par participation. Um, there were also other other things. Many people that participated said that they felt uh, uh, instrumentalized and that they did some uh, um, recommendations. They suggested many things, but uh, nothing happened after this. It was just getting everyone in a room for two days. You do some. You give the mayor some ideas, and then nothing happens, you don't get any feedback after some months saying, okay, we did this, we didn't do this because of this. Um, so it's really been a, a difficult journey, let's say. I think some of the mistakes that were made were probably could have been uh, uh, worked out before. Uh, and and it's very important that it works because if, if the first experience experience works, then people want more. Yeah. If it doesn't work, and if they feel like okay, why would I why would I give up my weekend to stay in a room in city hall discussing this? If then nothing will will happen. There is also a a, a problem which is this was something created by just the mayor, mm -hmm. and it was just a project of the mayor. No one else was involved in this, not the city councillors, not the municipal mm -hmm. assembly. Um, we actually asked many times to get the, the um, to get the specifics of how the process would be would be conducted, how it would work, and and this was never was never given to anyone or even uh, publicly. Um, so it's really something that worked just uh, unilaterally. You, the mayor calls for this, they meet, they give the mayor these recommend, recommendations. He says, he does a press conference saying how amazing we have here many good solutions to solve the climate crisis, which was also one of the issues that it was uh, debated, probably a bit too broad to try to solve in two days. I mean, I wish it was this easy, just get everyone in a room for two days and we can and we can solve it. But actually many good proposals were put forward. Um, but then nothing really nothing really happened after this. So there is the problem that it can also create some frustration for the people. Yeah. And and so the next ones maybe less people want to want to participate. So there is always this this debate about if they should be, let's say, if the if the decisions of this of this citizens assembly should be mandatory or just recommendations or not, um, which is an important issue, of course, because uh, it gives the power or not. But it's also if the politicians will take them seriously, because I mean, if even if they are just recommendations, but if there is a a will to take it seriously, then something needs to be done and something needs to get the feedback back to the people and say, okay, we worked on this, we d decided this or that, and we are putting forward these new proposals. Um, so this was also getting into the more the specifics, the, the, the problems. Some, some of the issues are being solved, like you said, the, the way to choose the people is, is different now. Um, there is also, there is always, uh, I mean, all, every way, it's very hard to find a, a way to reach everyone today. Because if you use the internet, some people don't 
still don't use the internet, older people that are alone. If you just use the mail, probably some other type of people will not mm. um, be so keen to participate. So there is always this, also this issue of how to get to the people and how, and not just how to let them know you can participate, but how to actually go after them and say, no, please, we want you to come and to take part in this. Because there are many these incentives for specific groups of people not to participate in the democratic process. So I, I think this is also one of the troubles that this experience had. Yeah, no, indeed. And I think it goes back to like why the, the starting point, though, needs to be the seriousness to take into account the recommendations, though, because it's totally logical that people have an innate sense of when their time is being wasted. <laughs> and I think it risks fueling greater disillusionment. And I have, I mean, I'm sorry, but I, it sounds like people are very reasonable to feel like they were maybe instrumentalized by the way that mm. things have been done. And I think from my perspective, maybe what was well, in all honesty, somewhat frustrating is that it's not like we're starting from scratch here. Like we have 600 examples of these assemblies around the world. And the work that I was doing at the OECD before founding Democracy Next was looking really in depth at this big study of these examples, looking at 80 different variables, doing an analysis on that basis. Also in a more qualitative way, working with practitioners and policymakers and, and experts and academics developing international standards of good practice because we actually have a pretty good idea of how do you design these assemblies and what needs to be in place for them to on the one hand really be effective lead to rigorous recommendations that take into account the complexities of the trade-offs and on the other hand that they're done in a way that's genuinely democratic and not just in a technocratic way either and things like enough time like minimum four days paying people having the accountability mechanisms all of these things are part of those principles and so i feel like there's like a pretty good starting point actually of how do you do this well um, and how do you ensure that people's time is respected you know in the example i gave in, in france one of the questions i get a lot is like oh but you know that's a lot of time there's only one person who dropped out of the whole process because mm. they changed jobs part way through and it was just impossible to, to keep going. Everyone else came to every meeting. So maybe they missed one out of everything. So it really shows you that actually, if people have a sense that this is taken seriously, this is important, they are more than willing to actually give that time. And if those barriers to participate by paying people, providing childcare, those sorts of things are also there, that also actually enables this to be, to be democratic and invites those people in who, who might not be able to or might not want to otherwise to. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think just maybe final thing of going back to why I was really emphasizing why I think we need to move to actually having an institutionalized approach because if we look at the example, for instance, the first place in the world to set up a permanent citizens assembly with people selected by lot that functions together with the parliament is in Ostbelgian, which is the German speaking community of Belgium, it has about 80,000 people. They have their own parliament with quite a lot of competencies. So the parliament has 25 people and now there's a permanent citizens council with 24 people selected by lot for an 18 month mandate. Um, every six months though, a third of those people rotates out and is replaced by new people. So there's always some mix of fresh perspectives and people who've been there longer and they have an agenda setting role. So it's also up to the citizens to decide what should be the issue that goes on the table in the first place. So they decide what's the issue that goes to the citizens. And then those are some of these recommendations. There's now a legal mandate that they have to go through a parliamentary committee. The parliament must have two debates and a vote on them. Mm. And so the, the more ongoing 18 month citizens council also plays an oversight role in making sure this actually happens, what's going on with the implementation of the recommendations. So like the, 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 the MPs are there, the parliament is there, no one's replacing the parliament, but it's about the system kind of evolving in a way that actually gives these new institutions real weight, but connects them in so that there's actually a feedback loop and accountability mechanism and, and people can take this, this seriously, but mm -hmm. also they're, they're, you know, the MPs are not required to accept <laughs> every recommendation, but the requirement of this process means they have to at least 
really seriously mm -hmm. weigh them. They have to provide a rationale. If no, why not? And I think all of that really matters too. And why I think we need to be thinking about this, not just about the one-off ad hoc initiative dependent on political will. And I think actually the rest of the system should be involved, like not just the mayor's office, mm -hmm. but working with the councillors and so on too. So, yeah. And about the issues that get um, debated, would you say, I mean, the, the example in France was a very specific one. Mm. This example in Belgium, it's, I mean, the, the citizens themselves can choose what they want to, what yeah. they want to, to debate there. I mean, there are also very different models of how, how, of how it can work. Mm. Would you, th would you say, I mean, if it works better with more concrete issues or with broader problems, it's, I mean, it's quite hard today to d discuss just something specific because everything is interconnected and you always have to touch different subjects to, to, to discuss it. But would you say it's a, it, it's a way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, mobilizing the citizens to participate that works better for broad issues, climate change or the democratic crisis itself or any of the migratory crisis, all of these big crises that we are always hearing about, or does it work better for very specific issues? The, the... Yeah, well, I would say somewhere in between, more, but more specific though, like mm -hmm. if we take the Ost-Belgian example to stick with that, the sorts of issues that people have put forth have been things like, how do we improve the working conditions of healthcare workers? This was before COVID happened actually, <laughs> so smart citizens. Um, <laughs> How do we, imp what do we do about the affordable housing crisis we have in the region? How do we improve our system for lifelong learning? Again, given this wider context, big picture, tra like transitions with jobs, technology, etc. But very specifically, what do we do here in the region to help people out with that? And the most recent one has been about how do we better integrate people of a migration background into our community? So as you can see, quite specific, but nonetheless actually touching on issues that are of like a bigger picture nature mm -hmm. as well. And I don't think it works if it's just about the climate crisis. You know, it has to actually be framed in a much more specific way because, I mean, that's related to basically everything today. <laughs> so there, there needs to be something that's tangible and kind of connected to the different policy areas too, to do with, with transport and energy and housing and, and so on. And recognizing the interconnected nature of these problems, but nonetheless creating some parameters and boundaries of what you can actually really have some concrete deliberations on as well. So. And it's also important that it's something that, I don't know, you tell me if you think it is, <laughs> that people can tell it's very related to their day-to-day -day lives. Because sometimes, I mean, the broader the issue, the more, let's say, disconnected some people are. Uh, so if you talk about how to integrate people in the community, how to uh, work something here, <laughs> maybe this is easier for people also to, to relate, to be interested in solving this problem than just, okay, let's solve all of this at once. Well, I mean, yes and no, because I would say something like, you know, end of life issues in France is not something people are probably grappling with every day. Hmm. But at the end of the day, there is actually a bigger public debate about some of these things going on. And it's not like there's an obvious answer to it. If we think about, I mean, Ireland is a country that has now been doing these assemblies at the national level for over a decade. Um, touching also on constitutional questions from same-sex marriage, abortion, blasphemy and divorce. There have been four referendums that changed the constitution. There's going to be one related to gender equality later this year. Um, one about biodiversity loss to introduce the protection of that into the constitution. Um, but they've also tackled issues to do with climate change. I don't remember the exact framing of the wording, but it really underpinned Ireland's Climate Act in 2021 that passed. There's multiple references to that assembly in the legislation itself actually. Um, they're deliberating about drug policy reform right now which and really recognizing the interlinkages also to security and policing issues to mental health issues to you know lot like again 
working with the complexity of that, I don't think most people every day are affected mm -hmm. by those issues, but there's a recognition, I think, that these are a societal set of, of dilemmas. These are not also just technical issues. There's obviously always a technical nature to them, but they're ultimately political, moral, ethical dilemmas too. And so they need public deliberation and, and, and debate and, and, and thinking about what are the values also that underpin what do we do about this? Um, because on, on that front, there's not a right or wrong answer, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's something that also evolves over periods of time. So mm -hmm. yeah. you, you, you talked about uh, also referendums, which is one of the, let's say, more tra traditional ways of mm -hmm. direct democracy, of uh, direct citizens participation in some sort of, of law. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we had the Brexit referendum is the, the biggest example of this, of how also these moments can be uh, manipulated or make the debate about something that it's really not and to make it simpler than it is. Um, we also have some experience with this in Portugal. Um, many other countries uh, have also experienced with, with this. It's a very powerful tool. But that, uh, I mean, at least in my opinion, it's very easily um, manipulated because you, you try to have this very complex debate with the politicians and the parties and the interest groups and everyone in a very short time. So uh, I think we could all agree that the Brexit referendum was not a, was not a, a very fair decision, a very even democratic decision. Uh, and we also see now that the poll, the polls show that the majority of people want to want to rejoin. Is this the citizens assemblies, the, this way of, of working is a way to improve on this debate, on this participation? Is it a way to maybe substitute these more traditional tools or to work with them? Yeah, I mean, I, I... I feel like citizens assembly is almost like the exact opposite approach of, of a referendum mm. in many ways. And I mean, having lived in the UK and voted in the Brexit referendum <laughs> at the time, I, I shared the general thoughts about, about that. I do think sometimes you need them, especially, I mean, sometimes they're required, like in Ireland, you have to have a referendum to change the constitution. And I do think actually on a constitutional change, you might want to have a referendum. But I think what worked well in Ireland in these cases is that when people went to vote in the referendum, it was after these citizens' assemblies. So, for instance, to take one concretely on abortion, it wasn't just like framed as a yes or no issue. The citizens were not um, deliberating just on whether Ireland should have the referendum. They actually gave a very specific list of recommendations about if people vote for change, these are the specific things that should change in the legislation in terms of the, the conditions, support, etc. It's a very nuanced set of consideration, mm -hmm. actually. And so it was also that. So taking apart just this binary framing of the issue, but also when people went to vote in the referendum, they knew what change meant, which was also not the case in the Brexit, Brexit mm -hmm. case. And I mean, I think we can't all be involved in every decision all the time, which is why we need to have these mechanisms that allow us to rotate in those positions of decision making. And so the, the Citizens Assembly not only does that, but really creates the space for people to dive into the complexity of the matter rather than reducing the complex issues, as you were saying earlier, into a binary question. Um, which again is just also a way of pitting people against one another on issues that are rarely actually <laughs> black and white or yes or no. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. okay, okay, yeah, perfect. I was <laughs> just gonna ask to to have some questions, maybe Carlos first, and then um, we are. First of all, I'd like to thank you for being here. We are very grateful for having this opportunity to to talk with you about democracy and and democratic processes. And I was wondering if you could help us with a, with a, with a question. So, uh, in Portugal, one of the main complaints of our very recent NGOs, uh, environmental NGOs, we are a young democracy and our NGOs are, most of them, uh, the, the big majority, uh, have at the most 30 years of age, uh, some of them 40 years of age, the one, some of them were um, launched 
early on after the the revolution a, a few of them just a, just about 10 years later and we had more than 40 years of dictatorship so these ngos what they usually tells us is that it's very difficult to mobilize citizens here in portugal mm -hmm. for um, activities that usually are actually very participated in other countries they have democracies of 50, 60, 70 years old democracies, 80 year old democracies. Um, and this is just to participate as, um, as um, uh, um, someone that will pay a subscription to support the NGO in their activities. So, in that regard, in countries, in countries that have gone through uh, such long dictatorships that suppress the will to participate, um, and where it is actually very difficult to mobilize citizens for even for simple uh, processes, what is the best strategy to mobilize uh, the new generations that are already being born in a, in, a, in a more free environment, but still receive from their parents or, or their grandparents uh, some of the trauma where uh, participation was actually suppressed? So first question, what is the best strategy to mobilize? Mm -hmm. Second question, is there a study that you recommend us where this correlation maybe has just has, has been explored between, between older democracies and younger democracies and the uh, effectiveness uh, or the, um, the, how easy it is to mobilize people for citizen assemblies? Mm. So, thank you. Yeah, those, thank you for your, for your questions. Those are, Two big questions. I have to say on the first one, I feel like I don't have all the answers to that. I think it's a very fair set of kind of observations. I think it's one of those things that probably will take time. And there are things like I, like I do think, again, it's not a magic bullet solution by any means, but we also have the evidence of how when people are part of a citizens assembly, because of the fact that it's also brought in people who are not traditionally active in politics or other things, people become a lot more activated actually in civil society and are more likely to set up new NGOs and local associations, to get a lot more involved in volunteering locally, maybe to get involved in traditional politics, to run for office. And so we do see that knock-on effect. And of course it's limited if you have one assembly with 50 people that happens once. <laughs> and that's where I think the vision is about how do we make this normal so that everyone's part of one of these at some point in their lives. And so I appreciate that's a question that, or that's an answer that necessitates a very long-term way of viewing it. And it's surely not the only thing that needs to, to happen, but um, I'm a bit less of, a, of an expert or sense of what, what are the other things that are happening in, in, that, in that space. Um, on the second question about the kind of correlation about people's levels of participation in citizens assemblies in these contexts like here and, and I guess other, other countries that had, have had more recent dictatorships and more recent transitions to the kind of systems we call democracies today. Um, I actually don't know in terms of the data about that. Um, in the OECD study I mentioned, we did collect data about response rates and things like this, um, but I've never thought to actually look into the correlations amongst those things. So I'm going to note it down and actually mm -hmm. look into it because it's a, it's a curiosity. I mean, a reasonable hypothesis might be that it might be a bit harder from that contextual perspective, but I don't actually... I, that's not based in any data, so I don't, I don't know is the answer to that, but yeah. So it's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, <clears throat> thank you for being here. I have a lot of dilemma questions and I don't know, uh, but I, I want to, uh, to question how can we avoid the the responsabilization of our politicians where when we 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 put the decision their decisions their votes on the citizens uh, level with the citizens assembly for instance um how can how can I say a, a better way? Um, how can we avoid the 
sim to put in simple uh, words like Paul said the complex problems that we had to solve um, for instance we, we can make the questions uh, the question where will we build the next Lisbon airport it's a very specific question but the problem is so complex in so in so many aspe aspects uh how can we in four days three months one year put uh, a very a broad um, sample of citizens with higher education lower education low higher uh, income all a, a representative one to discuss um, so so complex uh, too much complex uh, problem uh, and with that and uh, if you think that this uh, citizen assembly will uh, always be about the uh, little specific problem like uh, uh, the sidewalk in uh, an avenue or uh, how can we improve our street in our neighborhood um, and yeah I don't know I, I don't know <laughs> thank you yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, I see where you're coming from. I mean, first of all, I don't think there's been any citizens' assemblies on issues like how do we improve the sidewalk on the street? Like, they, they've always actually been of these bigger, more complex nature of, of the, the issues, precisely to create the space to grapple with the complexity. And actually, the, the airport example you mentioned to have a, as a tangible thing is quite a good one because there have been a few deliberative processes around these sorts of questions in other places like one of the most recent ones that comes to mind is in toronto i forget what was the exact framing of of the issue and so on but also these sorts of uh, and, and there's actually many examples to do with infrastructure related issues mm -hmm. because they're precisely complex they intersect with lots of issues but also people really feel the impacts of that in their daily lives in their communities and i think there's a question of you know they should probably have some informed say in shaping that decision that impacts on them directly too um and in in many places there's a uh, often a sense of stuckness on taking any form of decision on those issues. So actually, my first <laughs> book that I opened up. Let me just back, say we yeah. have been debating <laughs> the new airport for more than fifty years. So right, okay, really proved this All right. point. So okay, so there we go. So so more than fifty years. I wonder how much money has been spent on different consultations, on yes. different reports, on you know, and so. It really makes me wonder, like, if there was a citizens' assembly for six months or however long around this, could it actually unblock <laughs> um, the, the the stuckness on this and have some form of decision <laughs> taken on it too? Um, I mean, kind of, I guess, linked up to the initial point of the question, though, does this then de-responsibilize the politicians? Though, I guess it looks at what you, how you look at that that issue. I feel like we, we also put way too much pressure on politicians to have to decide everything and always. And it's also part of why none of them are willing in these mm -hmm. complex moments to actually take the hard decisions because they don't want to have the responsibility. So nothing happens. And so how do we how do we help shift what is the role of the politician in another democratic paradigm, too, but also how do we ensure there is a proper accountability for these decisions that are being taken? And that's why I think it matters so much, the design of a citizens assembly, that it's actually done properly, because that also is a part of what can engender the legitimacy behind the decision making that, yes, this group of people was chosen fairly, everybody had a fair chance of being selected, and it was broadly really representing the people concerned by this issue. Yes, they heard from a really wide diversity of the relevant stakeholders and experts and people from the community. Yes, they had the time to then really work with one another to find consensus. So all these things, I think, add up to, to a process that people can actually have more faith in um which is part of why i think we need that, <laughs> so, yeah. that that's a, a very good point i was trying to think of a time if i remembered 
ever a politician saying I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Ah, desculpa. Yeah. Desculpa. Sorry. <laughs> Technical issues. Okay. I, I was I was trying to remember a time if I if I remember mm -hmm. a politician just saying I don't know I don't have an answer mm -hmm. for for this which I think it's uh, it's quite rare. We had another question there. Well, thank you, thank you for coming and explaining us of the process. But my question is about a comment you made earlier mm. on the need to institutionalize these processes. Mm. So on, you, on your experience and what kind of recommendations can you make or can you share about how do you go about institutionalizing mm. the citizens in the assemblies? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question because it, it involves actually a lot of time and effort initially to actually work across the different stakeholders. So in the, in all the processes I've been involved to work on institutionalization, there's always been that effort made to make sure this is not just an initiative of the mayor or the leader or just one party that's in government. So in Ost Belgian, actually it was both the leader of the government and the leader of the parliament from two different centre-right parties that came together and launched the initial conversation about this. But then we met with every single MP every party and that parliament voted unanimously to put in place this this um, institutionalized assembly so even though there's been elections new government in between it's not in question actually the existence of this and i think that's a really crucial step that i think sometimes people don't immediately recognize and we've always made that effort in all the things that i've been involved in to really have those conversations more widely with and also with other relevant kind of stakeholders and, and civil society and others in the field but the most important in some ways is for this not to become a sort of very politicized initiative but actually something that you can get that broader support for this to actually um yeah be sustainable for, for the longer run and so so that's a first step in a way and once there's the buy-in that yes let's do something <laughs> then there's a work of really understanding deeply what is the current institutional political context here um, so what's actually how do we make sure this actually connects into this ecosystem so i gave a bit of the high level um examples of it connects into the the parliament the parliamentary committee system when we worked in paris there's also additional existing institutions like um there's a council of europeans living in paris there's a council of young people and stuff so the system in paris is also slightly more complex because we made sure that these new institutions actually also are working together in some way and that this is plugging into this wider system so that's always like the next set of considerations to first really understand and get a sense from the different you know stakeholders in the within the system so the mayor the councillors the administration are usually people we've spoken to to get an understanding of who really matters that we plug plug this into and the thinking about how do you integrate this into the relationship with the administration matters as well um, because sometimes actually some of the pushback comes less from politicians and more from civil servants who feel like, you know, we are experts on these policy issues and so on. And so how do you get them to also understand that this is something that helps their work and that this is also a relationship they have with the people that are in these assemblies too. Um, and then there's like a next step where we do some work with like lawyers and other things to actually create a legal kind of basis and help draft um, kind of how this can work. And that then usually goes back and forth with a bit of a political debate and conversation. So, you know, in Ost Belgian, we had a first draft of how this could and should work theoretically based on a lot of good practice. But then there's a lot of political decisions such as like, upon what basis do we want this group to be representative? So often it's to do with things like gender, geography, age, something that captures socioeconomic differences. So it's often education levels, but it can be something else. Um, but then is there another criteria that's really relevant? You know, in Belgium, the language issue came up. And so, but that's a political question, actually. So that's up to actually the politicians to then have the debate about about that and should we is it anybody living in this place or is it only kind of citizens in the passport holder sense of the term that's also a political question so just to say there's also then a political conversation that happens to get to a final kind of 
legal text, which is the underpinning um, mechanism for how this functions. So. Hi, thank you for being here. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. I want to go back to a previous topic about trust. For me, it's like a key mm -hmm. aspect in democracies, especially when we talk about populism and extremism. Um, and you told us that actually these citizen assemblies increase trust among the people uh, present there. So my question is that uh, in the structure of these assemblies, do you have specific moments to promote the trust, like uh, dynamics to promote trust, or is it just a natural consequence of the assembly itself? And my second question is that if there is a difference between physical meetings and online meetings. Mm. Yeah, really, really good questions, because I think this is at the, at the heart of it. It goes back to certain elements of the design decisions and so on too, because trust does not magically happen um, there's a lot of research actually that shows that trust takes time to build and that it is stronger in, when you spend more time in person with people and so um so the, the kind of in-person component if we're concerned about trust as why uh, one part of why do this i think really matters um, there's also some newer research which is showing that actually it's also having time for those informal moments like the dinner together and drinks together and time for coffee in between the meetings um, that also is important for trust but it's actually also important for enabling people to be better at grappling with the complexity of the issues so it actually has multiple benefits and I, it's also another reason why in person it's a lot easier to have dinner with people in person than on zoom which i think we all learned in covid time <laughs> So, um, and, and, and we also learned, because I mean, I, I continued this work during COVID and I was involved in the design of some assemblies that had to be done online for the sake of continuing with the democratic processes. Um, and we learned that it's, it's really not easier nor cheaper to do things online if we want to actually stick to the democratic nature of what we're doing. So for instance, we did one process in Cantabria in Spain 10 people who were selected did not have a computer at home. And so, you know, this is kind of, you know, we, I think many people here probably, you have your computers and it's not a consideration, like of course, for all connected and stuff. Some people had never used Zoom, Some, pe you know, so there was a lot of technical support given to people who, who needed it that like enabled this to actually happen. And, and actually at the very end, they were able to meet in person at least once and for all of them they were like overjoyed that that was possible so anyway so people have a very different experience but we have also seen there's possible ways of adapting and doing elements online but i think often the logic about let's do this online is driven by a sense of let's make this more efficient and more cost effective and i just want to say that neither of those things from experience um, if we care about the democratic aspects which again i think there's a big risk and some people approach this work in a much more technocratic perspective um, which you could easily i think veer into and for me it's always been really important to keep that aspect but but yeah, so uh, yeah, we, and, and, and it's also why we need time and why I feel like also for the trust element, like even two days is not very much mm -hmm. time. Um, and especially it depends on, on how maybe controversial an issue is. But, you know, one of the stories that has always really stuck is very powerful for me was during the Irish Citizens Assembly on same sex marriage. So it's a story that now has been told quite a bit and, and so on, but, you know, I'll just to, to illustrate so it seems less abstract too. So on, on the very first day of this assembly, there is Fintan O'Toole, who is a 50 year old truck driver from a really small rural village who arrives openly homophobic at the start of all of this and, and how he describes himself. And he arrives and he sits down at his small table he's been randomly assigned to across from Chris, who is the 26 year old tech worker from Dublin, very openly gay, painted his fingernails, wears his earrings, like wants everyone to visibly kind of know that he's gay and that this is a part of his identity and he's coming into this space in this way. And both of them on the first day show up with their prejudices. Chris is like, oh God, I'm beside old Ireland here. And, 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 uh, and Fintan is like anxious about sitting beside this man who's, who's gay. And this process lasted numerous months. And over that time, 
they became really good friends. They realized they were both kind of anxious about different parts mm. of the process in different mm. ways. But also through this whole thing, Fintan was able to share for the first time ever, because of something he never shared with his wife or parents or kids or anyone, that he had been molested by a man when he mm. was a child. And he shared this with the assembly through this process. and and shared it in a way that he wanted people to understand that actually he realized that pedophilia and homo and like being um uh being gay are not the same thing mm -hmm. which for him given his experience were always kind of intertwined and and also realized and recognized how for chris it wasn't even just about the right to marry but about his whole place in irish society um and being recognized as an equal fellow citizen mm -hmm. and everyone um so anyways there's more details to that story but i'll leave it there just to say I don't think that could have emerged with a shorter process. Hmm. Yeah, you know? that, that's quite fascinating. Actually, one of the things I was thinking about asking, and I, I will pass you after, it was if there was a if there was a, a, a limit, something that could should not, let's say, be discussed by this. And usually, minority rights are one of the things that we say. I mean, there can be a ninety percent consensus that that gay people should not exist in a society. This doesn't mean that they that this should happen. No? So there is an issue of human rights also. Like, is there a boundary that this citizens' assemblies or any kind of, uh, let's say, this participation process sh should not cross? This was my question, uh, you know? Because usually in Portugal, at least, there is always, and in many other countries, if you are discussing this uh, same-sex marriage, adoption, all of this, there is always someone that says, no, we should have a referendum. Mm. And there is always someone that says, yeah, but this kind of right should not be subjected to a referendum. It's not something you should, you know, like you should not put this up for a debate, even though we know you need to... You need to debate them. So I think in a way, I'm, I'm just making this comment because I, I think you answered the question mm -hmm. that actually it helped to show different perspectives and to maybe get a different understanding because mm -hmm. it's not just the politicians that are polarized. It's society in general. It's mm -hmm. different, um, different social groups. Mm -hmm. There is always this you know, I'm with the people that look like me, that behave like me, and I do not want to understand where the other person is coming from because this person is not immediately recognizable by me or mm. identifies uh, by me. So I, I think this is a, a very interesting story and a very interesting way of looking at this in a broader perspective. Yeah, and I think, I think the other aspect that's really interesting and important in thinking about the fact that like the kind of communication mm. and media coverage and other things also really matters a lot around these assemblies too and there's a huge potential both as um you know a, a tool for learning but also as a way of helping engender like wider public deliberation about these issues so especially on these issues of abortion and same-sex marriage in ireland having this assembly happening having all these live streams from the different like kind of expert and stakeholder presentations and things and like a hundred thousand people watch the live streams from the abortion mm. assembly for example so like quite a lot of people <laughs> when you communicate about the fact this is mm. happening and it's an important issue but that also enabled a lot of people to actually have a conversation with their family and friends in a way they were not able to beforehand and so and i think that was part of what help the change along. I mean, there's a lot of research which showed that in many ways, Irish society had kind of moved forward on that issue before the assembly mm -hmm. took place and so on, which I think is true. But I nonetheless think that that process was just helpful because it really, there's so many people who shared stories about how how it enabled them to have these conversations with their families, how it gave some people confidence to come out, how it like was able to get people out of, again, the black and white nature of these mm -hmm. issues into saying, well, you know, I might not agree with you, but I can understand where you're coming from and getting people to see that on same sex marriage is not just about the, the right to marry, but it's also about these people's place in society, I think was also a big transformational shift for a lot mm. of people that, again, 
because of the way these debates get framed, I think we need public deliberation on things like even minority rights and other stuff because these are political questions as well. And I mean, I have my views on what we have to have enshrined, but I think I think we will only get to a place where there's wider public legitimacy around the decisions behind them if we give the mm-hmm. space actually to for those conversations to happen. Mm-hmm. So okay, and it's a and it's a uh, signal of trust in people to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, of course, it's <laughs> uh, it shows that you can yeah. treat treat them as adults <laughs> and that they can get to good decisions. Uh, on their own. So there was another question there. Uh, hello, and uh, thank you for coming here in, uh, in Lisbon. Um, so my question was about the socialization during the process. Um, I actually have two questions. So during a deliberative process, um, people uh, have to work together. They will have to design all, I mean, the governance around this process that may last for two, three years. But the uh, the issue of uh, this is like, um, how do we feel? Do we have people feel included um, when they arrive? And like, there will be someone, I don't know, someone who knows about holacracy coming in and say like, I want to be facilitator here. Oh, we don't know what it is. So you will be. And it's already been like socializing. Suddenly like left-wing holacracy wins already in the beginning of the process. And it may change later, but like, I wonder how we can delete this this feeling oh i'm here and i don't know if my voice will be heard because i don't understand what happened i don't know who is this guy speaking about and the other question is uh, during the process there will be like companies lobbyists politicians all these people speaking having dinners as you said but like four people on a table and how does that that go off of the road um does this actually happen to be written somewhere after the, the debate, after the, the assemblies? How do we keep track? And do, do we want to? Uh, keep track of what exactly? Of what, of what has to be written? Um, about the, the part that has been socializing, but like outside, um, let's say we, we meet in this room uh, to, for have an assembly, mm. but actually we have dinner after and we speak about the, the same subject. Great idea happened, then we come back, but we have been socializing that, like the four of us, let's say. And then we come here and like there are 200 people, we ask someone to resume what we said, but who is the secretary who takes notes? How do we actually have people's voice listened to? Mm. Yeah, th- yeah, those are those are all really good questions and aspects that are crucial to the to the design of these assemblies. So I didn't go into the details of this, but there's also always like a governing committee of some sort. So depending on what level of government complexity of the issue, it's slightly different. But the premise is that there there is a group of people who are kind of independent to the process and have some oversight and who are the ones who together as a group also kind of choose um the information and the experts and so on that people will will hear from have the invitations out to stakeholders which include lobbyists and others that also have a voice but lobbyists also include civil society organizations it's like really in a broader in a broader sense um and all of those submissions though are fully transparent and and public and part of what um is also one of the good practice principles and which is a common practice is and again why time matters is that people have the right to request additional information um, before going on to a stage of needing to deliberate and having skilled facilitation is also crucial um, because as you rightly say not everyone comes into such a room feeling the same way feeling the same confidence about their own capacities um, you know I would probably need to be quieted down a little bit because I do this all the time and you know there's people who are a bit quieter so you need someone who very skillfully is able to bring people in without putting them on the spot either Um, and actually before these processes kind of officially kick off I mean I made reference to the fact that there's often like a dinner and stuff but actually also before you go into any like deliberation on abortion or whatever the issue is there's also a bit of a sort of induction in a way where people also 
decide together what are going to be the rules that govern their deliberation amongst themselves so it's almost always the same things like you know we will respect each other and we will listen and you know all of these things but actually it makes a difference to actually have that process in place um, people also talk about their values and what values are going to drive this deliberation um, they often have a kind of session around like bias what it is how to just be aware of it um, kind of what's becoming more common too is acknowledging that we're all coming into the room in a context of just structural inequalities as well and so just so people are kind of aware of this um, and also um, and even like given a bit of like expertise about how do you question experts because also experts come in with a certain authority of their subject matter and how do you also like have the confidence and you know types of formulations for questions and stuff so there's kind of like this whole thing that happens before people actually hear from any sort of experts and so on and part of the, the learning phase is also often learning about you know how does the government work how are these like what's the institutional setup here like how are these decisions taken what's the budgetary constraints and limits about this so also people understand what are the parameters and boundaries around the possibilities too so and it's part of what determines that at the end of it it's not some sort of wish list of things that are also impossible to do but people have also been <laughs> deliberating in the context of like well this is the the budget as well and things like that too that are into, taken into account which is also part of like going back to the trust issue what helps engender trust in both directions because actually people also recognize how hard it is to take these decisions. And so like, it's easy to bash the politicians, but then you realize, oh, actually this is really difficult <laughs> to figure out what do we do about this. So anyways, I'm kind of going back and forth here, but these things are really related and it made me, me think of that too. So. Hi, I'm Federico, I'm the guy who brought you here. <laughs> I'm very glad that you made it. Uh, I have a brief question. Um, a, that you, because this session is called Design and Democracy, so it actually comes from the exhibition you're working with the design curators Vera Sacchetti and Amelie Klein for the Federal Museum of yeah. Germany. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. And also, to piggyback on that question, um, what do you think is the role of cultural institutions such as museums to mm. involve people in, the, in these debates, if they are kind of a third space in between where people work and study and the politicians' home. Uh, yeah, so but thanks. Good to see you here. Yeah, thanks, Federica. I, I, I appreciate you asking that question because, um, yeah, the work at Democracy Next, I would say, largely falls into two pillars. One is really like making this change happen, building the institutions, but actually the other core part of it is around opening up the imagination mm -hmm. about this next democratic paradigm really being possible and what could that look like and the fact that actually this is already <laughs> happening in many ways. And so part of that work, um, I mean, part of it is having conversations like this, but a big part of it is also with cultural institutions and also thinking about how do we democratize public institutions more broadly so we've been talking a lot here about the context of the Lisbon City Council and maybe in Portugal and so on but actually there's a lot of other types of publicly funded institutions that are taking decisions that are with public money and have an impact on communities that could be democratized so one of the projects that we're working on in collaboration with um, with Vera Sacchetti and Amelie Klein who are two designers are um, citizens panels on democratizing the museum, working with the Federal uh, Museum of Art in Bonn and also the Regional Design Museum in, um, in Dresden in Germany. Um, and in both of them, there's going to be citizens panels with people selected by lot that have a remit to be thinking about both the physical public space in and around these museums, but also the programming and other aspects that could actually make these into spaces that are for the wider community and not the, in the words of the museums, largely older, wealthy, white ladies. <laughs> so, and because there is a large amount of money going into these things. So really quite interesting um, to be working with these institutions on actually applying the same principles of what we've been talking about. But we're also working with them curators on, on an exhibition around redesigning democracy 
we don't have the official title yet, but the premise of it is redesigning democracy. Um, and so that will open next year in Bonn and the year after in Dresden. And actually there's a few other institutions that are now interested also in working with us and collaborating with us on this. And those exhibitions will be attached to some public programming to help also engage local communities around these, these issues and have conversations around <laughs> them. We're working with the London Design Biennale and also Vera and, um, and Amelie and also um, architect Marcus Neeson, who's done a lot of like very participatory approaches to, to different things, um, to do a public installation in the courtyard of like this, it's called Somerset House in London. If anyone has been there, it's like really in central London, a big public space that lots of people, even if you're a tourist and you had no intention of going there, you could come across and stumble upon. So also thinking about how do we also bring this maybe outside in different ways to, to places that people are going through and, and just finding more creative ways to try and tell these stories and, and perhaps also do some film work. There's also some documentary and, and other filmmakers who've approached us recently. So, because I think, I think we have a lot of conversations about like the democratic crisis and what's wrong with things and a lot of analysis on the problems. And for me personally, anyways, this work gives me hope and gives a concrete sense of how things could be different. And I think it really helps to open up that imagination for a lot of people of like, we could be really doing things quite differently. And it is possible because we see it's already happening in many places. So, yeah. And, and I think actually, yeah, we, we should be engaging the cultural sector as well. Hi. Um, I have a <clears throat> Sorry. I have a question about uh, and more a curiosity about the me media coverage of these uh, meetings, if you have some experience about telling this, because I think the main way that we touch with the politics, the decisions that are made are through newspapers or watching the news. Sometimes I'm, I'm from Brazil and I live here for like nine months. And sometimes I say to my mom in Brazil, don't watch the news because it'd be like very sad and be like very <laughs> anger about the state of things. And sometimes the things are not as bad as it is. So my question is, uh, how is the media cover was made about these uh, these meetings for the people who weren't there to trust the process? Because I, I, I understand that it's easier to trust the process when you're inside there. But when you're not and you just hear about someone telling what happened there, mm. how was it? Was good? Was bad? How, how was it? Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And the, the media coverage, I think, is super important. And journalists have a responsibility to be playing here. And it's been quite mixed in different places. And quite honestly, I've been in contact with a lot of, um, you know, usually there's the secretariat within the administration. That's really the main link between these assemblies and, and the wider public and the political sphere as well. And they have tried to get media briefings and journalists along to observe or to watch and to cover this. And because it's a lot less like of a clash and exciting to come and like watch people deliberate and like hear evidence about these issues and stuff, a lot of journalists don't even want to go and cover this. And I think that's again, there's a responsibility there actually <laughs> to be doing to be doing their work. It's been shifting in the places that I think have had the more high profile and, and maybe like the big issues like in Ireland, there was a huge amount of coverage, but there was also you know, it, media briefings organized by the Secretariat with journalists at the start and end of every assembly weekend and all of this. In France, I have to say, it's actually been quite good. Um, like this last assembly on end of life that I mentioned had coverage in every single major paper in most of the regional papers on like different radio channels, 8 p.m. evening news talk show, members of it were being interviewed, um, really high levels of public awareness that this happened. Like I was just having, I had conversations with three different taxi drivers in Marseille in the south of France recently, and they'd all heard about it. So <laughs> it was some sort of test actually that this is penetrating beyond like the political geeks who are following these things, you know, it's self-described <laughs> there as well. So, um, and, and so it shows that actually it, it's really possible actually to, to reach those higher levels of public awareness and understanding. And I think that's been linked to some of the shifts in public opinion as well, because um, in some of the most recent polling that's been done in, in France, Germany, Italy, and the UK has shown that around two thirds of people 
want these citizens assembly's recommendations to be binding um, and most people have heard about them and understand what they are which is which is a, a shift because i had done some of my own polling for my research back in 2014 and 2015 which found really low levels of awareness but also um, most people wanting them to be advisory um, and so i think my hypothesis is like as people actually understand see how they work like have the faith in the process and the other people part of it are, are more willing to actually shift that power to be decision making and that's part of where that legitimacy and accountability will come from eventually too um and and yeah i i was going to make another point but i lost the train of thought so <laughs> yeah thank you um, thank you very much uh, no. ah, yes. Tiny curiosity, how do you ensure that everyone gets a seat at the assembly? Uh, everyone as in a sample of society, since nowadays we are more, we have a more broad um, uh, idea of what everyone at the table means. And does it, um, for instance, I was wondering if does the the composition of an assembly depends on the issue or it is always uh, uh, a mimetic uh, image of society? Right, it's a good question and I think, well, there's a few different layers to an an answering it in a way because again, as I was alluding to earlier, it's a political question to decide upon which criteria are we deciding to make this. But uh, ideally. Ideally, yeah, but, uh, I, but you... even ideally, that's also a political question. My <laughs> ideal is maybe different to your ideal and okay. your ideal okay. and so on. So again, I think that's why there's also like a governance process to setting up these assemblies to decide how how do you do that. In some cases, like I think in Ireland on the constitutional questions, they had people who were passport holders of like Irish citizenship. And I think for other issues, it's been more open in terms of everyone living in Ireland, regardless of the citizenship status. So there's also kind of kind of maybe legal practical elements that come into how do you determine determine that? And then I think beyond that, to reach the inclusiveness criteria, it also comes into things like the, the invitation letters perhaps going out in multiple languages that people are paid that childcare is provided like those are all the things that help break down those barriers to participating that help make it more inclusive at the end of the day as well um, so there's a big kind of correlation between if those things are provided and who is saying yes to the invitation too so ultimately it depends on the theme of the question right or not yeah, it depends on the on the theme of, of the question to some. I mean, there's always like, I think, a minimum core that's in all these assemblies to do with like often gender, age, geography and socioeconomic differences. But there's often a couple of other criteria potentially, depending on what's relevant, depending also, again, like in France, it's it, you're not allowed to collect any data about ethnicity, for example. So there's like it doesn't exist. Yes, like yeah, okay, well. yeah, okay. So so there you go. But in other countries, that's not the case. So you know. So that's what I mean. That it's like there is a level of it depends, and, and it is also a political okay. debate. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we are already <laughs> going on the on the way to to finish. Okay, I will I will pass. I would just like to. Also taking what uh, Frederico had asked and what I mentioned early that you also had some experiencing it's experience mentoring social design masters, which I mm -hmm. thought was very, very, very interesting. So I would also and, and also this uh, work that you've also been doing regarding this. Maybe it's a bit broad question for this <laughs> for this hour, but how does the way we design things in a broader sense? influence also how we participate, how we engage, how mm. democracy itself works. I think that's also, a, a, I mean, a, a, an important question, question here. 
yeah, I mean, the design elements of this are actually at the heart of it because these are all design decisions, actually. How do you design the process for selecting people based on what criteria? How do you design the invitation letters? How do you design the space in the room? Hmm. You know, we're actually doing some work actually on that spatial element at the moment too, in, co in collaboration with Marcus Neeson and some other architects and, and others in, in that space. So, um, and so with the, the, the social design master students, I had mentored them around like designing democracy 2050 and try to open up the imagination to think like in a very broad way about different ways we could think about democracy differently and what does that mean and how would you think about design elements to to it too um which was an interesting exercise because all of their other courses had to do with like i don't know they were making alternatives to plastic out of algae and like <laughs> like very tangible <laughs> things like this and then i came in asking them to think about the design of institutions but um, but but it's like just to get the thinking about the fact that these are all like designed decisions and that depending on how we design things, we get very different outcomes that are more or less inclusive, more mm -hmm. or less deliberative, more or less conflictual or con consensus driven. And again, those are kind of decisions we take about what are we aiming for here. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's also important that we take them intentionally. Yeah. So th to be sure that the outcome mm -hmm. is uh, is expected. Okay, so last question, and then we we finish. Hola, um, did you start to think already about uh, the new design of democracy, um, according with the growth of artificial intelligence and the impact that it will have in the future, which is already now, uh, grow that it can be exponentially next years to change totally the way how we can deal with ourselves then democracy will be totally different? <laughs> Big question to, to, to end on. Um, I mean, yes, from multiple, multiple angles. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, anyways, my starting point has always been about, you know, what are actually the democratic principles and ideals and then the processes and the institutions we want, and then how do different tools and things like AI come in to help support those aims that we're trying to achieve. Um, and from my perspective, I don't see AI replacing in any way the need for the human deliberation and aspect. And, and, and I care about all of those things like we were talking about earlier that I won't repeat why I think we need to, to keep that. At the same time, definitely think that AI can actually come in and help improve and enhance aspects of sense-making and other elements within those deliberative processes. So one of our collaborations is with MIT Center for Constructive Communication, because they've been developing some really great technology, um, which can be used. I mean, it's a bit complex to, to explain in a short period of time now, but basically it, it works with the voice recordings of the deliberations that are happening and using AI to help synthesize them um, and, you know, helping that, that phase of like, I don't know, I think we've all been in a small group conversation where you have a conversation and one person reports back what we talked about and you're like, were we part of the same conversation? And so <laughs> I think AI can be helpful in actually bringing a bit more weight to like the evenness of how we, how we, how we make sense of those conversations, how we um, combine the fact that there were 10 small group conversations and how do we bring that data back. So we're doing a lot of thinking actually and work around how AI can be helping to improve in person and online deliberations that are taking place, um, but not replacing the human elements. Like it's never, it's not been from that perspective, at least the work we're, we're doing. Um, and then there's another element, one of the projects we're about to, we're kind of just getting off the ground is around how could we have citizen deliberation led governance of AI related issues on global and local levels. So that's, yeah, maybe uh, I'm happy to have a conversation with people <laughs> interested, but I, I think, um, again, these are not just technical issues. There's big societal implications around all of this. And so how do we ensure that deliberation and people are actually, it's not just the AI labs deciding whatever they want to do, <laughs> which is the, okay. the, the status quo. So, yeah. so I think it's a, a very positive note to end <laughs> on. I think yeah. we all hear that AI will destroy a lot of things in our society. So maybe it can also help improve democracy. 
thank you very much for coming here and talking to us. Thank you everyone for for coming, for the questions, for the debate and the discussion. I think it was, I mean, I'm biased, but I think it was very, very interesting and it's uh, very important. Uh, and thank you very much for coming here and speaking with us. Well, yeah, thank you, Pablo. Thank you all for your really great questions and for taking the time to come tonight as well.